you for the nice and spontaneous introduction. It's a great pleasure for me to be here in this beautiful country and especially this beautiful city and to have the opportunity to present uh, the work that we are doing together with my team at the Helmholtz Center Berlin about the characterization of catalytic materials for solar water splitting by using soft X-ray spectroscopy in in situ and operando modes. So at the beginning of my talk, I will give a short motivation why we actually want to study solar fuel materials. We heard already quite a lot about this uh, during this day. I give you a bit of a different perspective. Um, then I will show you which techniques we are using for this uh, by our soft X-ray spectroscopies at the synchrotron. And I will present to you our in situ and operando cells that we are developing uh, for absorption and emission spectroscopy, followed by one of our recent applications on an LH study on cobalt borate, and I will end with a summary and an outlook. So together with my colleagues from the solar fuels department at the HZB, we're working on the development and characterization of solar fuel materials. So these are materials, um, for example, that allow for photocatalytic water splitting, what we want to do with this. Um, so ideally, we would like to shine with sunlight on our device, and this device should allow us then to split our water molecules into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Why we want this? Because hydrogen gas, as we heard, is already um, a good uh, material to store the sun energy from the sunlight. And on the other hand, you can also use it as a fuel, for example, to drive with this your car. And the nice thing with this is that basically, when you use hydrogen as a fuel, what comes out at the end is basically just water, so it's a very clean source for um, as a fuel. Such a photoelectrochemical water splitting can take place in such a device, as shown here. Um, you have here an anode side, you have in the middle an electrolyte solution containing your water, and on the other side you have the cathode. The reaction that takes place here, for example, under alkaline conditions is shown here. It's a two-step process. In the first step, you're basically um, creating your oxygen gas. This is the oxygen evolution reaction that takes place at the anode. And in the second step, you are creating your hydrogen gas. This is the reaction that is taking place at the cathode side. The bottleneck reaction for all this, so the most energy expensive step, is the oxygen evolution reaction taking place at the anode. Accordingly, it is one of the big challenges to develop and optimize anode materials that allow you to carry out this process as efficient as possible. One approach for this is that you combine, for example, as shown green here, a material that is a good photoabsorber with a catalyst shown here in purple, which allows you to separate the two processes of photoabsorption and the catalysis, so the oxygen evolution reaction. Um, very good materials for this application, or materials that we are currently focusing on, are non-noble metal oxides. There are several reasons for this, because you don't actually don't want to use materials that don't allow you to go for large-scale applications. It doesn't help you to have a very good catalyst if it's very expensive and you have use rare metals or something like this, where you see already that it's hard to scale it up. Therefore, we would like to optimize these non-noble metal oxides because we have them in high abundancy, we have low cost, and we have a high stability. However, for these materials, uh, compared to expens more expensive materials, they have, there are a lot of properties that still have to be optimized. Um, so the optimization could uh, take place, for example, with respect to the conductivity, to the electron hole recombination rate, so this should be, for example, relatively low, rather, or the surface reactivity of your catalyst. So what do we need to optimize the materi these materials? It is very often done just on a very simple trial and error approach. Ideally, what we would like to do is to make this on a knowledge-based approach, and this requires a detailed knowledge about the electronic structure of your materials, and also a detailed knowledge how this electronic structure looks like during the operation. So not just when you put your materials in the vacuum, but basically while you're applying voltage, while you're shining with light, while the material is in contact to your electrolyte solution. And this, however, can be quite challenging. So this, um, um, this is basically what we want to do. We would like to understand the electronic structure of ma these materials by using um, core level spectroscopy. Um, to give you an idea, because I think you're all from very different fields, what uh, core level spectroscopy is about, I start with a schematic here on a single um, atom. What we're doing there is we are shining with light on our system. By this, if the energy is sufficient, we can excite an electron 
from a lower shell excited to a higher shell. Um, and the next step, we are in an excited state, it will not stay like this, the electron from another shell will relax and it can emit then again a photon. So this is basic, the basic process for our spectroscopies, but what can we learn with this? The good thing is about that all these transitions, this absorption and emission processes, are taking place only for very dedicated energies. So you can see, depending from which shell you go, you need special energies to induce use this transition, and also the photons that are sent out um, have a very dedicated energy, which allows you on the one hand side to see, for example, which element you are um, addressing. So you can, for example, selectively choose only your transition metal to excite only your transition metal. And on the other hand, you learn about um, the direct electronic surrounding of this transition metal. So you can learn about how is it binding to the ligands, is it strong, is it weak binding to the ligands. So these are all the information that are important to understand, for example, the catalytic properties of your material. So as I said, we want to look at the transition metals. Another name for transition metals is also D-block elements, as you can see here in the, um, in the periodic table. And uh, for the system that I would like to discuss later, this, for example, the cobalt, it lies in the middle of this, why these materials are called D-block elements, because they are all characterized by a partially filled D-shell. And this partially filled D-shell and these partially um, uh, uh, unpaired um, D electrons there allow you that these materials can have multiple oxidation states and that they can basically, for catalytic reactions, uh, pair up with other electrons from the surrounding in order to drive your catalysis. So all these transition metals are very uh, well known for catalytic applications and are therefore of interest. So, for example, um, to show, you, to show you a bit how this reflects on the electronic structure. If I look now at the D-shell, for example, for a cobalt-3 um, atom that is inside an octahedral complex, so this is information now about the surrounding, what happens there is that your D-level can split up into two levels, in the EG and the T2G, and now there can be a lot of different configurations how the electrons can be located there. You can have in high spin state that they fill up basically all levels, or they can, more of them can pair up that we have here something like a low spin state. And all these, depending where your electrons here are sitting, is reflecting, for example, on the magnetic properties, but also on the binding affinities of your material. So we would actually like to know for our material where exactly do our electrons sit, what is the energy difference, the energy gap here between, so the ligand field splitting and so on. These are all informations that we need to understand this system. So how can we probe now this system? So I showed you one more time the 3D, um, 3D levels. One option to make here a transition would be, for example, with, with UV vis light. This is a, a spectroscopic technique that I think a lot of people can have in their lab. Then you can make here between the T2G and EG uh, a transmission. The problem is that in this UV vis region, you have a lot of transitions that overlap. I cannot selectively probe now only my cobalt. I can, because um, in this complex environment where I would like to study with electrolyte solution, with photoabsorber, I have the oxygen there, I have nitrogen there, I have a lot of different elements with which this transition would overlap. Therefore, our approach is different. We um, take light in a different energy reason, region. We make a transfer from a 2P level to the 3D level. This is a dipole allowed transition. And this lies in the region of the soft X-rays. So in order to probe these orbitals in an element-selective way, we need to go to the soft X-rays. And this is basically what we are doing for the soft X-ray absorption spectroscopy. We are shining with photons uh, on our sample. By this, we excite an electron from a, a lower shell and transfer it here to the unoccupied states. By scanning now through the incoming photon energy, we can map out this unoccupied densities of states and learn by this about the unoccupied electronic structure. As I said, when we create here a hole, it's a secondary process. What we usually have is a relaxation of the electrons. So electron from a higher level will fall down. It sent out a photon, and this is what we're using in the X-ray emission spectroscopy, um, because here we detect now exactly the energy of this photon, and by this we learn about the distribution of the electrons here in the occupied density of states. So as I said, these experiments cannot be simply done just in a lab. We need for this a large-scale facility, and we are doing our experiments at the Bessie 2 synchrotron facility, which offers us um, several advantages that are basically also needed. 
So we have um, at the Bessie Synchrotron um, very, very small spot sizes with very high intensity of light. Furthermore, we have this light not only at one energy, but we can cost continuously uh, drive through different energy reasons, regions. We have different beamlines. Ours now currently, for example, goes from 170 EV to 2,800 EV. We can have also have polarized light for studying some kind of orientation effects. We have a ve very well-defined time structure in order to make also dynamic experiments. And we have a long-term stability that you also sometimes don't have in every lab that is, for example, based on laser spectroscopy. So what you this, by the way, a uh, picture from the Bessie 2 synchrotron facility from the top. So inside here, what is hiding there is a synchrotron ring where the electrons are created. These are then injected into the storage ring. And when we send now these electrons through um, specific devices like an undulator, we are creating from these accelerated electrons photons in all kinds of energy regions. And we are using for this basically the soft X-ray photons. So, the photons that are created in the ring go then out to beam lines. So basically, we have around 50 beam lines at Bessie 2. So whoever would like uh, to make an experiment can come to one of these beam lines. You just write before a proposal with your scientific idea, and then you can either come with your own experiment or you team up uh, with people from Bessie uh, who can help you then and advise you whenever you want to make there an experiment. So the light from the synchrotron goes in through the beam line. There it is monochromatized, that we really have only one energy and focused for your experiment. And as I said, we are using the soft X-rays. The challenge for soft X-rays is, however, they are very nice for transitions in transition metals, but also very nice to excite uh, or study the oxygen or the nitrogen, because they are, absor they are absorbed by oxygen and nitrogen. This means, at the same time, that they cannot penetrate air more than a couple of micrometers. And accordingly, when we want to make experiments, we have to make all these experiments under vacuum conditions. So this cell is then deposited, or this cell is then uh, is, is, uh, put basically into a spectrometer, which allows them to make absorption and emission spectroscopy. So the light comes from the Bessie 2 synchrotron, and then the uh, X-ray absorption spectra are recorded um, with a total fluorescence yield diet. And for emission spectra, we send our photons on a grating in order to separate the photons of different wavelengths. And I detected then in a CCD detector um, with a multi-channel plate. So this was now basically our cell for absorption and emission spectroscopy. For those among you who know a little about, a bit about this, uh, they will also know that for absorption spectroscopy in the total fluorescence yield mode, there can be sometimes artifacts which are challenging. Therefore, we developed a second configuration which allows us to measure absorption spectroscopy in fluorescence mode compared to absorption spectroscopy in transmission mode, which is a direct, mo which is a direct way to measure the absorption, but which is a bit more challenging. So in this uh, configuration, we have now this back end cell directly connected here on this side to the vacuum, but the rest of the cell is outside of the vacuum. So the light is coming in from here. Here we have again a thin membrane. Behind there is our liquid chamber with our electrolyte solution and with the contacts. We have this thin membrane here uh, separating the electrolyte from a helium chamber. And here the helium chamber is again separated by a membrane from the vacuum. Why we do this? So, ah, and the, the fluorescence is then basically detected here by the two diodes that are here. Why we make now the helium chamber in here? Because we would like to have a very fast exchange from this configuration to the transmission configuration without breaking the vacuum. For this, we simply replace this back part here and put in our transmission configuration, where again the light comes in from here. Here we have a stack of two membranes. In between, we have our sample where we can apply voltage. We can shine light with our diodes. And here in the back side, we have now a diode to measure um, our transmission spectra. So a short summary and outlook. I hope uh, I explained to you the basic principles of our in situ cells and operando cells. I showed you that we can um, carry out these measurements for X-ray absorption and emission spectroscopy. I explained to you for the core level spectroscopy and our experiments on the cobalt borate that we can make here uh, element selective studies to look really just at different species in our material. And then we can uh, get detailed information here about uh, the oxidation state distribution and that we can also by this uh, uh, interpret a correlation between the activity 
and the active species of the material. As an outlook, what we will do further is that we um, further probe resonantly these, um, these uh, specific species with X-ray emission spectroscopy or the resonant form of this to reveal also the charge localization in these materials. Uh, we will carry out further DFT calculations and make also further comparison, as, you told, as I told you, for different, um, for different uh, material systems of this class of material. At the end, I would like to thank my colleagues from the Solar Fuels Department of the HZB, as well as my colleagues from the Methods of Material Development Institute of the HZB, and my current team members, Dr. Lee Feig Xi and Christoph Schwanke, so the Cobalt Borate project, this is his project um, of his PhD thesis. And I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>